with wearable technology, and this is uh, part one. Um, now, I did change this because I know you've seen this before and I've given it to you before, so I have changed it quite a bit. So uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting and there'll be some new information for you. It's also been updated with a lot of the new technology that uh, is now available. So the goal of this presentation is to teach you two things, two common medical conditions that will lead you to incapacitation or stroke. How wearable technology can help you identify these conditions and seek medical help. So that's the goal. Disclaimer is this, uh, the information and my thoughts here are not the views of any organization. Uh, they're not meant to be any personal medical advice. Uh, you should always check with your healthcare provider before changing any treatment plan. And uh, the people in this presentation are fictitious and do not portray any member of our community. Uh, I, I don't know if I told you this, but I did give this um, talk to a, um, a resort, uh, gee, which I can forget which one it was. Does it say in here? Um, I, gave it, uh, I gave the talk to, um, to one of the resorts locally, and as a result of the talk, uh, someone had downloaded the cardiogram app that we're going to talk about. They had um, got an alert, went to the hospital. Uh, got admitted to the intensive care unit, and uh, the cardiologist said if he hadn't come in that night, he would have for sure died that night uh, at home because he had a serious heart problem. So this presentation, had, and they wrote me a nice letter. This is the letter they wrote me and thanked me, and the, the resort wrote me and thanked me. So this presentation has saved lives already. So uh, that made me feel good, and um, that worked out well. Um, now, just, just to remember, um, there's a lot of money to be made here in these devices. Uh, this is a huge business. If you go to Best Buy and you uh, go into Best Buy now, you'll see wearables are huge. And we're talking about um, uh, spending on wearables predicted to hit uh, $52 billion next year. Uh, and this is even going to get better because the patents are already out for, for, for diabetic monitoring. We'll talk about that in the end, but this is this is probably will occur later on this year. So big big things happening in this wearable technology, huge amounts of money that are going to be uh, transferred. A lot of it is around the smart watch. You'll see that uh, the smart watch is about 17 or 18 percent of wearables uh, about, of the total amount. Still the earwear, the earbuds still are uh, really big time. All those little things you put in your ears and listen to music and all that sort of stuff is still where, uh, where most of the, uh, most of the, um, uh, the money is still being made. But Apple, I think last year, did 29.5 million units for their watch um, just in the last quarter, and that was a 200% increase over the previous year. So the, lots of money. Now, the, lots of money. Now, one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about was all the things these watches do and how some are different than others, all right? And we've talked in the first presentation I gave you I said the uh, Galaxy Active 2, which Diana has, I said it would be getting, it wasn't, it wasn't um, uh, certified by the FDA as a medical device uh, for atrial fibrillation, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but it was getting approved by the FDA and it, they went down the, the app. So there are, there are certain functions in these devices that are what we call level two medical devices and they require the FDA approval and they require actually certification in each country. And the cardiac monitoring and atrial fibrillation we're going to talk about today is one of those, um, one of those things that, that has to have, uh, it is the same as a, a, an electrocardiogram machine in a hospital. These are level two medical devices that are licensed as such. And so the whole pulse and atrial fibrillation monitoring uh, has to be approved in each country. Whereas the fall detection isn't, it's not an FDA, it has nothing to do with that. Anyone can put fall detection on the machines, whether it works or not, who cares, but, or who knows, but, but, but fall detection is not. Uh, the second one uh, that will be coming out this year is blood pressure monitoring. And again, this is a, this is a level two medical device that, that is, uh, and you will see this on the uh, Galaxy 3, 
the watch. Uh, it's been cleared in South Korea, uh, and they're now doing the ambulatory of blood pressure monitoring on the uh, on the Galaxy okay. 3 watch. Uh, and that's a, that's a very interesting, I haven't added that yet to the talk, but how they do that is really quite interesting. But this is, um, this is again, an FDA approval. Fall detection is not, uh, and uh, but diabetes and blood blood sugar will certainly be there. We're going to talk about oxygen monitoring in a minute. That is not as well. So uh, again, that's when we talk about level two medical devices and getting approval. It just makes it slower. And some of the things that we want to do, it takes time because a level two medical device has to have sort of government approval. Now, since I talked to you um, last, of course, we now have three watches that do cardiac monitoring. Uh, the new Apple Watch Series 6 that's out, uh, this, is, um, this does the atrial fibrillation detection, of course, as, as the 5 and the 4 did. And so the price of this watch, uh, the Series 6 in this particular configuration, uh, and this was at Best Buy in the United States, was uh, $399, okay? So that's the, that's the Apple Watch 6. Now the Galaxy Watch 3, which of course is the latest watch that's out, it does cardiac monitoring, it does atrial fibrillation, and it will do blood pressure when it's approved. Uh, and this watch, nice looking watch, is $369. Now remember, the, the Apple Watch must be used with an iPhone, right? Uh, whereas the Galaxy Watch 3 can be used on any device. So it doesn't, it's cross-platform, but the Apple Watch is not. Now the new one that you had this is really interesting um, because now the new one that is actually being approved by the FDA as well, I think they're getting a little faster, is uh, Fitbit or Google. Remember, remember I told you last time I saw you that Google bought Fitbit. Well, wow, did they ever come along? Remember I told you there were there's a lot of money to be made and Google's certainly gonna move quickly, and they did. And they brought out a brand new watch and it's called the Fitbit Sense. And this is the FDA approved. It will do all your cardiac monitoring. It's cross-platform and it's $329, all right, US. So that's the, those are the three current contenders that uh, will do pretty much the same, the same thing. Uh, and now those are the three, three devices. Uh, they look at pretty much about the same. The Apple Watch is on the left-hand side, and the Fitbit Sense is on the right. So they look a little, look a little bit different. Um, and uh, but but they're nice watches. Uh, now Diane and I were talking about this before the meeting started, and I just don't recommend the Active Two. That's the one Diana has. Um, it it uh, the fall detection still doesn't work in it, and as Diana said, she can't get the heart monitoring stuff to work either so I because you can buy this still at, at, at Best Buy and it's about a hundred dollars cheaper than the Galaxy 3 but I'm not I'm not going to recommend that until until this gets sorted out so I want to talk a little bit about um, I get a lot of questions about oh my gosh the new watches particularly the Apple watch does um, does blood oxygen or what we call pulse oximetry. So it measures your oxygen level. Wow. So uh, this uh, so this is um, this is what uh, what we would normally pulse oximetry means it's measuring the amount of oxygen usually from a device we put on your finger. This has been around for 40 years. It's not new technology. What's new about it is they've been able to put this into a watch. So uh, now you can, um, the Samsung Galaxy Watch 3 will tell you what your blood oxygen level is. Uh, the Apple Watch uh, Series 6 also does that now. So we have two watches that will tell you what your uh, blood oxygen level is. Uh, now Garmin and Fitbit are doing that, they've been doing that for quite a while. So this is not a new feature, <clears throat> excuse me, not a new feature for them. All right, uh, how, does, how do we measure, how, very interesting, how do you actually measure the amount of oxygen in your blood without doing a blood test? That's sort of cool, right? Um, well, it sort of is interesting, and it has to do with um, laser and lights. Now, what you probably know 
is your blood. There's your blood carries the oxygen, and the oxygen in oxygenated blood is redder than unoxygenated blood. So we have in our well, in our bodies we have we have oxygen. We have we have red blood cells that have oxygen on them, but we also have red blood cells that don't. They've, we've used up the oxygen; they're going back to get some more, right? So we have those two types of hemoglobin in our red blood cells that, that are floating around, and it so happens that um, the 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 oxygenated blood is redder. So what we do is we have lasers and sensors that um, will will actually tell us. How uh, I'll show you that in a minute. How much um, how much of the red blood, the real red blood is versus how much the less red blood is, and we do that by infrared light and laser lights, and we'll we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec here. So so again, uh, this is an example here, uh, and there's two ways that we do uh, we do a uh, a red light which uh, gives us one reading, and then we do an infrared light, which gives us another, and this creates a ratio, and from that ratio, we can come up with the number. And that's, so it's done by, by, um, by seeing how much red, it, the easiest way to just figure it out is the redder the blood is, the more oxygen it has in it, and we can measure that. So that's how, that's how we, we come up with these, these, these figures. Now, <clears throat> The um, what good is this? The, the the why measure your oxygen levels? Um, but you know, recently um, the ability to breathe is a big concern. Uh, many uh, first of all, there's all the wildfires that have been occurring in um, in in California, for example, and a lot of people have uh, COPD, emphysema, bronchitis. They have a lot of respiratory problems, and and of course, all these fires make this all worse. So would there be some reason why there might be some advantage in measuring your, 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 uh, the amount of oxygen in your blood? Uh, I'm just throwing that out. The other, the other one, of course, is uh, COVID-19. And this is a big one because uh, I'm sure you're all aware that uh, it causes respiratory problems. Uh, sometimes you start to get um, low oxygen levels in your blood before you develop symptoms. Um, and, and also, um, after you have COVID or have COVID, uh, it certainly indicates a worsening condition if your blood oxygen level goes down. So there's been some postulation, um, and there was one study that measured, I think it was um, pulse oxygen level, blood pressure, four different parameters and they said that they were accurate they were able to predict predict COVID-19 70 percent of the time with just just stuff that they could measure off the watch now that study was never repeated and never it's never it does not medical science or anything like that but it is interesting that maybe by gathering data from our bodies from these peripheral devices we can come up with some sort of some sort of sequence that would allow us to be able to better monitor or predict if we're going to get it or, or something like that. But that's all, all sort of up in the air at the present time. And also people with lung conditions. People with lung conditions, of course, this is uh, a big problem. And, and, and is there an advantage in you being able to know what your oxygen level is in your body if you have those problems? Well, actually, probably the only people that will probably benefit from these are what we call super users. Um, certainly mountain climbers, um, they require uh, to measure their oxygen as they sometimes take supplemental oxygen with them when they're climbing. Uh, free divers that don't have oxygen on their tanks uh, need to know what their oxygen levels are and as well as marathoners. So there are super users that, that probably will require it. But how, how accurate are these are these readings from devices like watches and since this is not a medical device these are not licensed by the FDA nobody really knows how accurate they are they're certainly affected by perfusion they're affected by cold weather as your uh, skin gets colder if you're up in some very cold area of the world and you're wearing a watch will it really give you true oxygen in your blood because of course you're 
your, your, your wrists and hands are cold, and so that will cut down on the circulation of that area and will not give you an accurate reflection. Uh, also, uh, it depends on your blood flow. If you have um, some cardiac or other health problems that may cause a reduction in your the cardiac output, then, then it's not truly going to give you an accurate reading. And also, it could be in light. If you're out in a very, uh, very light day and it's really bright outside, as it is in Arizona, will that have an effect on on the watch uh, and and the ability? So there's a lot of things that we that that it, it is not clear as to what benefit this is going to be to you, um, and we're not even sure how accurate these devices are. Uh, for sure, uh, people, um, the super users are fine, but we haven't really defined, you know, they put these in the watches and they said this is going to be a great thing for everybody, but I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with it. Also remember that the, um, the, the amount of oxygen in your system um, really depends, you have to put that in constant context of, of what's happening to you. If you're in the hospital with chest pain, and you are hardly having a heart attack, then of course, and your oxygen level goes down, that's a bad thing. Uh, but if you're sitting at home eating a sandwich and you're, you're happy and have no health problems and your oxygen level goes down, well, I'm not really sure that means anything, right? It's probably a false reading. So, uh, so we have to put all of context in together with this oxygen stuff. Um, we talked a bit about, this is a slide uh, that, that's interesting, as I told you before, the three leading um, um, companies that are doing wearable technology, of course, are Apple, which is the leader. Uh, Samsung is number two, but as I told you, uh, Fitbit now uh, with Google has, uh, has come a long way, and I expect they will be uh, probably an equal player to Samsung very shortly. And a lot of that is due to this lady, uh, we talked a little bit about AliveCore, which was a, a company that uh, uh, provided uh, portable ECG. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but Google hired this uh, this lady, Dr. Sherbati, uh, away from AliveCore. She did a lot of the original um, atrial fibrillation stuff with uh, with AliveCore, and they hired her to um, to come and work on Fitbit and Google. And the interesting thing was, was as soon as she came to work for Google, she was able to change the software and all of Fitbit's watches then were able to do atrial fibrillation detection. And I thought this was crazy good. So all these watches, you, as you know, Fitbit has a whole whack of different watches, right? And so she was able to change the software in there and they did an update and now that they, they were able to do cardiac monitoring not just with the one watch, but they did it across all these different different watches. So without without bringing out a new watch, none. I mean, I know they brought out a new one I talked to you about, but this was different. This prompted them to initiate the Fitbit Heart Study. I can't remember if I talked to you guys about that. I did. I know I talked to you guys about the Apple Heart Study, uh, but this was the Fitbit Heart Study that was uh, getting going. It's closed now and it's underway, and this is. Uh, you know, this was it. And of course, the Apple, I think it was one or two people in your group that signed up. I told you guys about the Apple Heart Study because that um, that will get you a, a, a significantly reduced Apple Watch. Uh, but that study's closed a long time ago and it's underway. So let's talk about Mary. Remember Mary? She's uh, she's uh, uh, is 74 years old. She's widowed. She lives full time at Silver Ridge Resort. Mary has lived there at Silver Ridge Resort for seven years. She's won the hearts of all her residents. She lives by herself in a park model with an Arizona room. Now, uh, and she has a very good friend across the street who she walks with around nine in the morning. Alice and Mary walk around the Silver Ridge perimeter and then have a cup of tea. Mary is very active and is a member of the Pickleball Club. Uh, and of course, her highlight of the week is our Monday morning Silvercom Computer and Technology Club meetings. Mary's been widowed for 12 years. She has a daughter who lives in Palm Desert. She has pretty good computer skills. She doesn't drive and she, um, she uh, uses Uber for transportation. 
Uh, her last physical, she, of course, Dr. Jones is her doctor. She likes him. He's down on uh, Fry's on Ellsworth Avenue. Uh, Dr. Jones checked her over, and she's on a mild blood pressure pill. But other than that, when she was checked over recently, he couldn't find anything wrong with her. Of significance, he noted that her blood pressure and pulse were fine. Now, on July 2nd, Mary was coming home. The thing about July 2nd is there's nobody in the park, right? Everyone's, there, there's only about 70, you probably a lot of you have been over to Silverage, but there's only about 70 people that are in that park of 700 homes in the summer. It's not like your park, your resort, where, where you have a lot of full time all year round. They don't, uh, they don't at uh, Silverage. So when Mary was coming home, she felt a little lightheaded uh, and she sat down on this grass here. Um, she didn't have any chest pain or palpitations or anything like that. She just felt a little dizzy. And a common problem when you're a senior is dizziness. She felt a little bit dizzy, and as John was coming by in his golf cart, he picked her up and took her home. So she, uh, she phoned Dr. Um, Jones and went to see him the next day, and she said, you know, I just had a little 10-second thing of dizziness, and then I felt okay, and he checked her over, and he noted that her blood pressure and pulse were fine. And he said, well, it just, it was only once. You only had it once. Let's just see what happens. And, and we'll, um, we will, if it happens again, we'll do some investigations. The reason I put this in and the way I'm going, like I'm going with this, is because she obviously had a cardiac problem. And what I'm trying to portray here is that these this type of problem she has is intermittent and it's often very difficult to diagnose because when the patient comes to see you, they're fine. So it's, 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 and, and if she had had an Apple watch on and she'd been wearing the watch when this happened, it would have given us the diagnosis, right? That's the whole point of this, this exercise that we're going through. I'm telling you the punchline, but you already know the punchline because you've seen this before, right? So, uh, so Mary, um, again, was, uh, about a couple of weeks later, she was, uh, she was cooking some dinner and the same thing happened again. And she had to sit down in her chair and she, um, she got better, it's fine. She didn't have any real problems. But she went back to see Dr. Jones who said, let's do some testing. And she said, fine. But unfortunately the testing got done, was gonna get done too late. In other words, she had another episode. When she got up, she went to the bathroom at night, she got up off the toilet and of course she got a dizzy spell again and she fell to the floor. She heard a crack in her hip, she broke her hip, and she got wedged by between the shower and the toilet, and she couldn't move. Now the problem is, this occurred at 2.30 in the morning. She called for help, but there is nobody in the park, right? There's nobody there. So um, it, this was a terrible situation because of course she had to stay on the floor all night. And fortunately, uh, Alice came the next morning to go for a walk, if, if she hadn't found her that in that morning, uh, she could have been there for maybe a week or longer. I mean, it would be, she would have died for sure because there's nobody around. So anyway, the ambulance arrives and they, uh, they take her to the hospital. She was uh, in shock and uh, not in very good shape. When she arrived at Banner Hospital, they noticed that her um, pulse was very slow. It was around 40. They put a temporary pacemaker in put her up in ICU, she was stabilized, had a permanent pacemaker put in, and then her uh, hip was repaired and she, of course, uh, made an uneventful recovery, which is great. So what are the lessons learned here and what, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with your heart. Uh, we're not gonna talk about any of these. Um, the one on the bottom here is, is, is people who have heart, heart attacks have plugged arteries and stuff like that. Um, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk, not going to talk about these are your valves. You have four valves in your heart, and sometimes you require valve, uh, valves to be fixed, uh, or sometimes the heart gets in, infected or inflamed. Uh, that actually happens a lot with COVID, but anyway, um, th we're not going to talk about anything like that. What we are going to talk about is the um, electrical circuitry of the heart. It's real simple. Um, all you have to do is think of this as a circuit breaker. On the right hand side, you'll see a circuit breaker and in a circuit breaker, the circuit either you have it on or off, right? Now, 
the uh, red arrow here indicates the main trunk line, the electrical line coming into the heart, and it hits the first circuit breaker, which is here. There's actually two circuit breakers, but we're only going to talk about the first circuit breaker. Now, if we turn the circuit breaker off, your heart would stop, and everyone knows that's a bad thing. So, so that's, that's one possibility. And, and certainly if we turn the circuit breaker off, your pulse is gonna stop, right? So it's, or it's gonna slow down pretty quick and stop. And if, we, if it fails in the on position and it gets too much power in here, then your heart's gonna go too fast. So your heart's either gonna go too fast or it's gonna go too slow. And that's all just based on this one circuit breaker, okay? That's all you need to know. So what we what, what we're what we're really talking about here, why these peripheral devices are so important, is the, is because they monitor your heart and will tell you if your heart is going too fast or too slow. Now you could do that yourself. You could take your pulse and you could measure your pulse yourself, but that's often not that easy to do. Um, so, so, so what I'm suggesting, and that's why I'm so interested in these devices, is that it's a, it's an easy way to monitor your heartbeat, you know, monitor your pulse. So we want to know if your pulse is too fast or your pulse is too slow. Now, um, yes. So how to measure your pulse? Uh, again, we can measure it either by feeling for it, or or we have lots of devices that will do that. Uh, again, the value of these devices. Uh, for seniors is, uh, is, 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 is not all the other things they do. These are a lot of these are activity trackers that, you know, they'll do, uh, you know, you can do exercise with them and all sorts of things. But what we're really looking at the value for seniors in our group is, is to, is the pulse monitoring. Um, there's also, um, a fall detection. We're not going to talk about fall detection today and emergency notification. Those are two of the things we talk about in part two. So, <clears throat> so why is it important if you have a slow heartbeat well this is again it's uh, i think we have you'll see circuit breaker one here and if if this this is the culprit here and if it starts to fail it's like um it's like electrical problems in your car if you ever have electrical problems in a car and you take it in to get it fixed you spend a lot of money. In fact, most people with electrical problems in cars, I think, just sell them and buy a new car because it's so hard to figure out what's causing the electrical problem. Um, and the problem in hearts is is the problem's intermittent. And, and that's what I was trying to show you with Mary initially was she had an intermittent problem. And when she saw the doctor, it wasn't obvious. Um, if we had been monitoring her heart with one of our devices, we could have, and she had looked at the her watch when she had the dizzy spell and saw that her pulse was 40, any medical student would make the diagnosis, right? They, it, it's this real simple, simple problem. Now, if you look at why this is so important is, is because of our age. This is the, um, this is the, uh, the line here. I think we put a line here and look at age 60. Is there anyone, is there anyone in your club over the age of 60? Uh, so I will draw your attention to the 60 and look at the line. So the line here if, uh, of atrial fibrillation or is of pacemaker insertion goes up really exponentially as you get older. So it's very likely by the time you reach 85, 88, 90, whatever, you're going to need, you're going to need a pacemaker. Highly likely because, because that's just part of the parts that wear out. You know, y'all, you you've had cataract repairs. We put uh, new knees in, new hips in, um, all sorts of stuff we put in. But also the issue is 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 the pacemaker number one, and that's what um, and that is uh, so it's a common problem. It's really common, and the problem with Mary is Mary could have died. She she broke her hip. She almost died of exposure, you know, and and it was all um, really a preventable thing if she had had the watch on. And she'd be able to identify a slow pulse rate. None of that would have happened. And again, uh, the Apple Watch um, just tells you. Uh, again, it notifies you if your heart rate is low. So the next thing is: is is your heart rate too fast? And again, it's the same circuit breaker number one that causes the problem. 
and it's stuck in the open position so your heart is too fast and this is called atrial fibrillation now that's when the two top chambers of your heart are what we call fibrillating and uh, that means they're not properly contracting and this has a very high risk of blood clots and stroke so again this is a stroke uh, a stroke situation and I'm I'm having a lot of fun in life right now uh, I just don't want to have a stroke and again if we look at the incidence of atrial fibrillation uh, in, in uh, again 60 year old and we look at the, the, the statistics here again it goes uh, it goes right up again it, and it should be the same because it's the same it's pacemaker pace neighbor, pace neighbor number one that's failing it's either failing in the in the uh, in the in the, in the um, closed or the open position uh, again here's an example of the uh, uh, the Apple Watch will actually tell you if you have atrial fibrillation. It says your heart is showing signs of irregular rhythm suggestive of atrial fibrillation. So it does that. Um, there's been a whole bunch of studies. I mentioned some of the studies that have been done. These, this was the early study they did with uh, Stanford Medical Center, and they saw that um, there is an Apple, the watches do a good job. There's no doubt uh, that the watches do a good job of picking up atrial fibrillation. Uh, they also do an ECG. Now, you've probably seen this ECG before. Uh, in 1860, they were still burning witches at the stake. Uh, can you imagine this fella here by his doctor was going and he was having, this is the first ECG machine there was, and this was in, I think this was in Germany, and he has a, uh, one arm in each bucket and a foot in a bucket of water, and they've got him connected to this device here, and they're doing some sort of recording. And so very early on, we knew that by measuring certain things in your heart, the, which we'll tell you in a minute, um, we could determine um, some pretty interesting things. In fact, um, by doing what we call it, now an ECG is, you know, you go to the hospital and they put these little stickies on you here, and then it prints off something that looks like this on the bottom. Now, from an ECG, we can um, tell what's how your heart has been in the past. We can tell uh, if you've been taking your blood pressure pills, if you've had, if your heart's been working too hard. Lots of information we can tell. It gives sort of a report card of the heart. We can tell present things that happen, which is um, if you're coming in with chest pain and we want to know if you're having a heart attack, we do an ECG because we can see that in the ECG, and that's the present. And also in the future, we can define what's happening in the future with your heart as well. So uh, all past, present, and future, that's why we do ECGs. Well, the, uh, the uh, Apple Watch does an ECG, as does uh, the Samsung Galaxy 3, and now the Fitbit Sense that I showed you, all those three watches will do this. And how it works is basically, if you look up here, you um, you hit the crown here. There's a little button here. It's called a crown. You hit that crown, and then it will start recording the ECG. The watch then sends the information over to your phone, and is stored as a PDF file. This is the uh, an ECG of a friend of mine who has an Apple Watch, who has an atrial fibrillation. He's on medication for it, uh, and the watch he sent me this. ECG and the ECG says it does not show signs of atrial fibrillation. So one of the advantages of the Apple Watch or all those devices I told you was that in fact um, it interprets it and will tell you that it is it is it, there is no evidence of atrial fibrillation. A lot of times through the year, people send me um, uh, copies of uh, or uh, um, advertisements for for. Chinese cheap Chinese watches, uh, and you can. <laughs> and, and there was one they sent me a couple of months ago. I should have put it in the presentation. Um, for twenty four ninety five, it did all the things the Apple Watch did, um, including saying Merry Christmas or whatever, you know. And it was for twenty four ninety five. Now, who knows how that all works? And and you know, buyer beware. One of the, it's not that difficult to record the ECG, where. It is important is the interpretation and telling you whether it's atrial fibrillation or not. And that's part of why it has to be FDA approved 
because we don't want a bunch of cheap watches running around doing this and not having accurate results. And that's why this has to be approved. So this is an accurate procedure, um, and that's, uh, that's sort of what we have. Now, the ECG the Apple Watch does is a, uh, a single lead ECG. So it is not, it's not like this complicated ECG that, 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 that we do as doctors. It's not the same thing. Uh, it has, the only purpose of that ECG is to help decide is your heart rate too slow or do you have atrial fibrillation. That's really all we're looking for with that ECG. It's not going to give us past, present, and future like that other one. Um, and again, it must be paired with your um, paired with your phone. And we've talked about that, and it will it will tell you either you have atrial fibrillation or you don't. Um, when I originally did this presentation, remember, Apple Watch was the only one that did this. Now, now all three of those watches that I mentioned early in the presentation will do this. Um, the other thing that um, I'm, I don't know if you've done this or followed up, but a lot of the uh, healthcare plans think this is a good value, and they actually will subsidize the purchase of the uh, of the Apple Watch. Uh, or I would imagine any of the watches now that, that I've mentioned, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but these are some of the, the, the plans that do in the United States. If you have any of the uh, these uh, healthcare uh, plans, uh, they all um, they will. Um, they will subsidize the and I subsidize the cost of your Apple Watch and, and I'm sure I'm sure lots there's lots more I just don't know what they are but so it's it's a good idea to, with your healthcare provider to find out if they're going to help with that uh, yeah that's that's an old one I don't want, and um, that's old as well um, now so the other part that that I think I showed you and I think I brought the little device to you. Let's go back to AliveCore, which was the company in the, in the United States that originally developed the atrial fibrillation monitoring, or, and, and that was Dr. Shabati. Dr. Albert was the founder of AliveCore, but Dr. Shabati came on and, and did some of the original, and they, have, they, they Apple technology initially was based upon on the work AliveCore did. Um, so AliveCore has this little device uh, which I think I brought when I did this in person um, to to your to your um, um, to your resort, and I'm just going to show you how it works. I have mine here. Uh, needless to say, um, on one resort I went to, there was 200 people in the talk, and they were lined up. I think there were 50 afterwards that came, and I was doing all their ECGs for them, and we picked up three atrial fibrillations that nobody knew they had. And we picked up one guy that looked pale, and he um, his pulse rate was 42. So I sent him to the hospital in an ambulance. So and this is just a group that was listening to me. So there's it is a common problem. Anyway, this is this is this is a cool little device. We'll show you how it works here. Uh, post-COVID, and it's, it's a good to monitoring with this uh, little device. 
Um, and here's what it looks like. This is uh, this was the one that I did. This is my ECG that I did on the uh, the cardio mobile, and this is what it looks like. And again, it, it turned out to be normal. Thank heavens. Now, what I told you about at the very beginning of the show was about the fellas who whose life was saved because he went to the hospital. So one of the problems that you could probably see developing here is that as we develop all more companies develop watches they have to get them all approved by the fda right for cardiac monitoring they all got to get approved which is just going to take forever so cardio cardiac cardiogram or sorry um alive core decided that what they could do is they could actually export the data off all off all these devices in other words uh and they could they could process themselves and and then tell you if you had any problems so uh, so there's an app called cardiogram and it's called car cardiogram it's available for apple and android and you download this app and you put it on your um, you put it on your phone and this app will um will connect with any of the um fitbit garmin any of the any of the devices that don't have cardiac monitoring it will take it will take the heart rate off of the uh off of your off of your watch and it will then take it and import it into this app and it sends it down to um a, some big supercomputers in the United States that and they're monitoring about half a million people at any one time and they will um and artificial intelligence uh scans these devices and will tell you if you have any cardiac problems so there is a good phone they phone you or they would uh email you or something if you were having problems and that would uh alert you about that and you can even tell them who your doctor is and they'll even alert your doctor i think the cost is 3 or 4 dollars a month for this service um excellent service uh, i'll show you what happened to me i think i told you this uh, before though um this was uh mine this occurred not this summer but last summer you'll see here um this big spike in the morning and you'll see my heart rate was way up here which was uh not in keeping with my usual activity and uh, of course i got an alert now it as you know, I told you this before but I was out golfing you know this is my nine hole golfing group that I golf with in the morning so of course my heart rate was up I was walking around the golf course right so but if I had been at home having chest pain and you know they would have that could have been a serious problem so um anyway they they alerted me and I said it's fine you know that's what I was doing and so on and so forth so it's a great service and it's um, it's cheap I mean it's 3 or 4 bucks I guess 3 or 4 bucks a month it's uh, it's a really good service i know some, i think some of you in your club have already done that currently you know anyway i would encourage you to do there uh and of course the um thing that's going to come out probably at the end of this year is the blood sugar and that's the big one and i'm going to be really busy talking about that this is this is exciting this was um a group of people uh that uh, presented this in january 2020 uh this is the uh, they are uh, the uh, they work at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Institute of Technology and also Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology this group here and they were able to take this device here called a Raman spectroscope spectroscopy and they were able to to actually um shine a laser beam into the into your uh, skin and come up with an accurate blood sugar so they were so this is a bloodless blood sugar um device and and the only problem of course it is is this is a big a big piece of equipment so how fast can you take this piece of equipment and make it into a watch and that whoever does that first is going to make an awful lot of money because it will change the way uh, that uh, diabetes is managed and all that sort of stuff so it, this um uh we will see this probably coming out maybe at the end of this year i know there's a number of patents that have been uh submitted on this but this is exciting stuff and i think you'll see this uh, happening quite quickly all right just in um to finalize now um the goal of this presentation was to show you uh how it was important to identify a slow heartbeat uh which of course you might require a pacemaker 
uh, is also to identify a rapid heartbeat, which is atrial fibrillation. Just to remind everybody, if you are 60, and if there's anybody in your club over the age of 60, that that's what, this, that's what the pacemaker insertion um, stats look like. So the older you get, the more common this is a problem. Uh, again, stroke and atrial fibrillation, if you are 60, and exact same same situation, um, uh, it goes up exponentially as you get older. Um, how can Mary be better prepared? Uh, and we're going to talk about that in part two. We go into home automation and all the other things that Mary could have done in her home to keep her safer. I gave this presentation to a group and one fellow came up and said to me afterwards, he said, you know, Doc, what's the theme of your, of your presentation? And I, and I said, I don't know. And he says, an apple a day keeps the doctor awake. So I thought that was sort of funny. So I had that in my presentation. I think that's it. That's it. So we'll open up the any questions. Ah, it was an hour, right? There you go. We will open it up. Did we